Funding for Path to Paradise is provided in part by Parsons Brinkerhoff. Parsons Brinkerhoff, planning, engineering, and consulting services on transportation projects in California and worldwide for over 100 years. Friday on our roadways, folks. Looks like northbound 5 is slow and go from India Street out of downtown up to SeaWorld Drive and then again from the merge into Checking Solana Beach. Checking spots for you right now. Northbound 805 slowing from El Cajon Boulevard to the 8 and then again from the 52 into the Sereno Valley. Northbound 5 is... You hear it everywhere. The number one complaint about life in San Diego is traffic. Traffic as in too many cars on the roads where we want to drive. We don't think about that when we buy the cars. We are seduced by the idea of the open highway, where the pavement unfolds as we progress freely to our destination. But the reality is much different. At peak periods in the morning and evening, from east to west and north to south, it's gridlock. Politicians across the spectrum promise to solve this problem if elected or re-elected to office. But each year, the traffic gets worse. And as the region prepares for another million people in the next two decades, we're looking at not just more bodies, but more cars. A million new people translates to about 685,000 new cars. Alan Hoffman is a transportation consultant with the Mission Group. Uh, now, each car has to be parked somewhere. And in fact, while there's still some debate about this and among experts in the field, most people give a range of, you need between four and six parking spaces for every automobile. I mean, your parking space at home is only generally used for your car. Uh, most places at work, the parking is only used for the people who work there. And then on the summer day when everyone wants to go to the beach, there has to be sufficient parking there. And the day after Thanksgiving, everyone wants to go to the mall. You need to have enough parking there. When you visit your friends, you want to have parking at their houses. So by the time you add it up, you really do need a lot of parking. If we use a figure of five spaces per car for San Diego, which is probably a reasonable guess, you end up with a need to add to the region about three and a half million new parking spaces. Now, each parking space is made up actually of the space the car physically sits in and then the space that's only used to get into and out of that space, uh, which varies from about 300 to 400 square feet total. If you use just the lower figure, just as an example, three and a half million parking spaces at about 300 square feet each translates to about 37 square miles of parking. We're going to need to pave over the equivalent of all of San Diego Bay, all of Mission Bay Park, the entire city of La Mesa, and then we still need to build a two-story parking deck over all of Balboa Park. Or if you prefer, we can take the entire Pacific coast of San Diego County, from San Clemente in the north to Tijuana in the south, that entire stretch, and pave it with parking to a distance of half a mile from the sea. That's what we need to add to the region if we continue our existing rates of automotive dependence. If only one out of six of those cars is commuting at the peak hour, I don't know if that's a reasonable assumption, but sounds pretty reasonable you would need about 1,300 lane miles of freeway just to hold those cars. That's the rough equivalent of adding nearly six brand new Interstate 805s to our region. That's looking ahead 20 years to a solution that transportation planners know is out of the question. But while they may agree on what won't happen, they have different ideas on what should be done now to reduce the rate of increasing congestion 
and those ideas are informed by their analysis of how we got into this mess in the first place. To some, it's how the region was planned. Transportation is destiny. I mean, buildings come and go, but the roads or the other kind of transportation infrastructure you put down, uh, that's going to be there forever. I mean, any old city you go to, chances are most of the buildings are, are new, but the roads you're walking on are probably exactly where they were originally laid down, with very few exceptions. So a city grows around its movement systems, and those movement systems tend to persist far longer than any building ever would. In San Diego, the downtown core and surrounding neighborhoods were built along the streetcar lines, lines that are now used by cars, buses, and the trolley. But the newer parts of the region, like North County and South Bay, were designed exclusively for the car. If you depend on the automobile for how your city grows, you're going to grow essentially in a relatively low, spread out way for the most part. And then the problem is, is as you grow out in this direction and that direction and that direction, uh, the trip times necessarily grow even if there were no congestion because whereas let's say in 1980 to cross the whole city would take 20 minutes and most of your trips would be taking place within that sphere, today to cross the city may take an hour and the trips that you typically take because now the place that you're working is farther away, the place where your mother chooses to live is over there, you end up spending far more time just trying to get back and forth. And eventually, even though you know, your micro decision, you got a better house, let's say you got a better place to live compared to what your other options were, your whole life ends up being impoverished because everyone else is making those same decisions. When land use and transportation aren't coordinated, what happens is there's a tendency for people to go to the outlying parts of an urban area where land is cheaper. Bill Lieberman is the Director of Planning and Operations for the Metropolitan Transit Development Board. Uh, you buy raw land cheaply and put some improvements on it. You can sell it at a great profit, and uh, that's, been, that's been common for the last couple of hundred years. And if there's no coordination of what we develop in the, in the far out fringes, we get low density development surrounding our cities, and then we just keep on moving further and further out. What you end up having is situations in this area, for example, where people will go out to Temecula to get cheap housing. And in order to get back and forth to the jobs in San Diego, they're using I-15. Now I-15 is getting more clogged up, so the people in closer in communities like Tierra Santa or Rancho Bernardo can't get to jobs because of people going further out uh, for, this, for these cheaper homes. But to highway veteran Jake Decima, it wasn't bad planning that has led to traffic, but the failure to build the plan for a comprehensive road network for the region. Well, whenever you design a system and take key pieces out of that system, the system will break down. And that's what's happened. The system is broken down because the system was never built. Jake Decima ran the Division of Highways in San Diego, which later became Caltrans, for 25 years. And on his watch, the state built some 250 miles of highways here between 1955 and 1980, including Interstate 805, which was named for him. But the system he designed went much further. Actually, it was more or less based on the Nolan Plan, which goes way back. And with my staff and city planners, we laid out the California Freeway and Expressway system, which was statewide, but we did the part in San Diego. And uh, at the time, it was anticipated that there would be financing available to build the whole thing by 1980. But inflation took over, and we only built half of it. So that's where we are today. We only have half of what we planned on. Kent Trimble of the San Diego Highway Development Association picks up the story. If you look, the land uses that were identified in the early 60s, that's how we grew. We, we grew exactly as everyone planned. The cities and the county have been very, very good about holding developers to that plan. If in 1960 it was envisioned for an industrial park to go in Sereno Valley, that's where the employment base is today. If it was envisioned in the early 60s that residential was going to be in Carmel Valley, that's where the residential is. We built out exactly as we were supposed to. What we didn't build out were the roadway, the infrastructure, to get you from your house to your job. He recounts what had been planned for North County. I always like to use an analogy of a ladder. 
the ladder was supposed to be I-5 along the coast. Inland from I-5 was El Camino Real. Then you had something that approximates to where Camino Ruiz is supposed to be. Then you keep going east and you had Camino Santa Fe. And then another north-south route called Black Mountain Road or about where Black Mountain Road is. And then as you go up the rungs of the ladder, you have everything from Miramar Road, Mira Mesa Road, 56, um, SA 680, and a series of east-west roadways. And they're really collectors in the, the traffic engineering term. They're large city streets. They're four and six lane streets that took you from the coast to I-15. As we grew, the rungs of the ladder weren't implemented. They weren't built. Um, the local opposition, the political opposition to building these roads and these arterials um, was great enough that the communities decided that it was in the best interest of the community that a road should not be built. Um, we built out the houses. We built the jobs. We didn't connect the two. We were relying strictly upon what's in place today, I-5 and I-15. And elsewhere in the region, other parts of the Decima plan were also either scrapped or delayed. To Decima, the cost of scaling back is still being felt. All these people sitting there in congested areas are wasting a lot of money. A lot of them are on a payroll, and so the payroll is greatly expanded, and the cost of doing business is much higher. You're also creating a tremendous amount of smog by sitting there in all the congested traffic. It was a very high price that San Diego's paying for this congestion. And nowhere is the congestion more acute than at the merge of I-5 and 805 in Sereno Valley. Here, the cars in the fast lane of 5 intersect with the slow lane of 805, and what had been a combined 8 lanes is reduced to 5. Commuters today question why 805 wasn't extended north to Camp Pendleton, running parallel to 5. Decima explains why that wasn't done. Uh, we could only plan 20 years ahead. And 20 years from 1960 gets you to 1980. And by 1980, you didn't need a freeway, a second freeway up to Oceanside. So we just stopped it where it would serve until 1980. And hopefully by 1980, some other transportation system would take over. But so far, there's nothing in sight to replace the automobile. Thinking ahead 20 years is still the model for planning today. And the latest 20-year blueprint for the county is the 2020 Regional Transportation Plan. It's issued by SANDAG, the San Diego Association of Governments. Sandag coordinates planning and distributes public funds among the 18 cities and county that make up San Diego. Eric Palkey is Sandag's Director of Transportation, and as he sees it, San Diego's in pretty good shape. We're in the midst of developing uh, a freeway system. Uh, we have good pieces of it, but we need to complete that. We're in the midst of developing a transit system, but it's not finished yet. We need to complete that. And we're in this plan, in, in fact, has a very comprehensive system of high occupancy vehicle lanes. When I respond that I think we, we have a good system today is that we have the basis of all of those networks today. And, and I think they do serve, except for some of the very peak periods and some of the peak uh, congestion corridors, I think they serve us very well. There are actually two versions of the Regional Transportation Plan, or RTP as it's called. The one featured here is Sandeg's preferred plan, which will cost close to $30 billion, a third of that to come from new taxes, taxes that have yet to be approved by the legislature or the voters. The plan calls for virtually every highway to include HOV lanes, more commonly known as carpool lanes. They are seen here in blue. The thick black lines show which highways will be widened, and the dotted blue lines show where new sections of highways will be built, from State Route 56 in North County to 125, 54, and 905 in the East County in South Bay. The RTP funding is cut roughly into thirds for local roads, freeways, and mass transit. This is the transit portion of the 2020 plan. It shows the major transit facilities, the capital type facilities, and as well the some of the major corridors for bus facilities that we would plan for the next 20 years. It's color coded. The, the blue uh, lines represent the coaster, the commuter rail, the existing commuter rail facilities. Uh, the red represent the, uh, the, the trolley uh, facilities, the light rail facilities. 
green are what we call transit ways, which can be um, a, a light rail facility or a regional bus or a rapid bus type system. It's a technology, it's a, a corridor and the technology really needs to be identified, but we think it's an important transit corridor. And then the yellow are, are, are proposed regional bus systems. If we could, to start at the north end of the county, I can get, kind of go through the, the major facilities. Again, the blue is the, the coaster. And here you can see that there's a, actually a, a code. The dash represents where there needs to be improvements to the coaster. Uh, and in this case, it would be double tracking. There's a, through a, a goodly portion of the, the corridor, there's only one track, which represents a constraint to the operation of that facility. So that would represent, this would be a double tracking. This red uh, line going across from Oceanside through Vista San Marcos out to Escondido is the, uh, the, the light rail line that the North County Transit uh, District is working on right now. They've gotten the environmental document done. They're doing the design. That will be a major east-west uh, transit corridor. These uh, yellow again, uh, for example, this would be a, a regional bus system down the El Camino corridor. As we go further down, uh, as you come over here to the I-15 corridor, this green dot uh, representing again a transit way, but in this case we've, where we've been working with MTDB, we think this is going to be what is called a rapid bus system. Again, this red is a, a trolley line. This would be service to UTC going down into the existing Old Town uh, where we've already got service on the trolley. Uh, as we go across the Mission Valley, we've got the Mission Valley uh, West Line, which was opened a couple of years ago, provides service from the stadium. Uh, the dash, dash line here would be the, the completion of the Mission Valley line from, from the stadium through the, UC, or, uh, the San Diego State uh, campus and connecting into the existing east line at the Grossmont area so to get out to Santee or to get down into uh, the downtown area through here. Uh, again, uh, some sections here are the blue re the dots representing the need to double track the coaster facility. And then going further down uh, the map here, uh, transit way again, something to be determined in terms of the exact technology, but a, a, a mass transit type facility going down and providing access to the border in the, in the developing Otay uh, ranch area. So that's, those are basically the improvements that we envision for the next 20 years. This split in funding among roads, freeways and transit mirrors what the public wants according to Sandag's recent survey. We think that the approach to solving the transportation uh, needs of the community are a balanced approach, that you can't solve it all with highways, you can't solve it all with transit. You need a balanced approach. Um, so what you'll see in the document is uh, some significant improvements on the highway system, some on the transit system, and then also on the local roads and streets. We've got to be able to get people from the, using those local roads and streets to get to the, the major highway facilities and also uh, to get to, for example, park and ride facilities. So you can't forget the local streets because that's the basis, uh, the kind of the initiation of the, of the transit uh, of the trip. It's balanced politically is where the balance happens, okay? But it's not at all balanced either by funding or strategy, okay? Carolyn Chase is the director of the San Diego Coalition for Transportation Choices, a nonprofit that advocates alternatives to the car. But one thing about the one-third, one-third, one-third is the one-third transit is one-third transit. What's the other two-thirds, okay? One-third is highways and one-third is local streets and roads. <laughs> so right there, it's two-thirds streets and roads and one-third transit. Okay, so let's get past that little, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, way that they explain that. Also, there's the issue of historical balance, okay? For the past, since World War II, there has been an utter imbalance of spending like 85 to 90 percent of all transportation dollars, state, local, and federal, went for roads. We built the interstate system. I mean, it's, it's all been dominated for roads for 40 years. I don't think it's, it's skewed. Uh, when you look at the amount of uh, capital, I think she's looking at the capital dollars. Um, you have to also consider that on the transit side, you have a, an operating subsidy. You need to operate those buses, those trains. And so when you start looking at those total expenses, uh, I think there's, there's, there's more balance in the system. And the, the fact it has to remain that um, even in the most ideal situation, you're not going to get uh, a, a real significant portion of people using transit. The automobile and the American lifestyle are one and the same, and people like their car, and it's hard to get them out of their car. 
the regional transportation plan is almost like a machine that grinds out money and projects and traffic um, that the system requires perpetual tax increases to work. I sort of call it the traffic treadmill because the way things are going, you just keep building, you get more traffic, so you build more, you have to raise taxes, so you build more, but there's more traffic. So there's something missing here in terms of the design of these systems. There was a study put out by the Texas Transportation Institute that studied major metropolitan regions all across the United States and analyzed how much money did they spend on building more roads and, ha and did they have less congestion. And what they found out is that the areas that spent uh, less money had less congestion. It's like it doesn't actually matter if you spend the money, you don't necessarily get less congestion. Not true for San Diego's RTP, says Palky, at least for the preferred plan. Well, it would actually reduce congestion. Twenty years from now, it would be less congested than it is today, and that would be a major accomplishment in consideration that in the next 20 years, we are going to add more than a million new people, a half million jobs, and 400,000 new houses. And our travel demand will go up about 34 percent in those 20-year periods. So with all of that growth and that increase in demand with this system, we could actually reduce congestion. The, one of the measures that we use for congestion is the, uh, the number of miles of freeway that are congested, and today it's about 60, 63 miles. Uh, if we implemented the preferred 2020 plan, it would be about half that, down to about 29 miles. But if additional taxes are not approved to pay for the preferred plan and transportation spending continues at its current rate, congestion will actually rise by about 40 percent. The man in charge of building the roads and highways that do get funded is Gary Gallegos, the district director for Caltrans. Among his priorities is I-15. One of the shortcomings of our freeway system today, it's, it's fairly rigid. You've got so many lanes in each direction and so many lanes in the next direction. And probably every San Diegan can think about it at some time in their driving life when they've been stuck in a traffic jam and they look across the barrier and, and they say, if I could only use one of those lanes on the other side, I could get going because there's, it looks empty. So Caltrans figured out a way to use that empty space. What we're proposing on I-15 is to build a freeway within a freeway. There's enough right away within the I-15 corridor. But there's enough room to put four lanes in between the northbound and the southbound uh, direction of travel today. And so the reason we're calling these managed lanes and something that's fairly unique is for the first time we're, 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 we're trying to develop a freeway system where we can manage the capacity based on the demand. And this four-lane freeway in the middle would be barrier separated from the other lanes but it would also have a, a barrier rail in the middle that's a movable barrier rail so that in those four lanes, if we really needed to on any given morning, we could configure all four lanes going southbound. Uh, on another morning, we might not need all four lanes going southbound. We may only need two lanes going southbound and that would still leave two lanes going northbound. We could do that. The idea is not new to the region. We move a rail every day on the Coronado Bridge and have, have some machine that has wheels that work like a conveyor belt. They pick up the rail and they run it through and they move it from side to side. And so by doing this, we can adjust lanes, take away lanes or add lanes, and we can manage. But Gallego says this won't work on I-5. In the case of I-5, you almost got a 50-50, you got as much traffic headed southbound as you do northbound at any given time of the day. And given that we don't have this directional split, what we think we can accomplish within the existing right-of-way is, is to widen the freeway, but in a different way. Instead of trying to widen the freeway all the way from the 5805 split all the way to Oceanside with X number of lanes, our traffic numbers and our projections show that there's a greater demand between 5805 and Encinitas than there is between Encinitas and Oceanside than there is between Oceanside and the Orange County line. And so our concept, we're, you know, today you have four lanes in each direction for a total of eight. Between the 5805 split and Encinitas, we would expand that freeway to a freeway that would have six lanes going in each direction and an HOV lane. So we would add two extra lanes plus a special lane for HOV. 
when we get to Encinitas, we would drop from, from a, a freeway that's overall 14 lanes wide, seven in each direction. We would drop two lanes out because we have less of a demand the next piece. And so we would go to ten, five lanes in each direction plus an HOV lane. And then when we get into Oceanside, from Oceanside to the Orange County line, we would carry an extra lane, hopefully an HOV lane, all the way to the Orange County line to complement uh, you know, some of the transportation improvements being made in Orange County. These are the plans, but it will be years before the work is done. We've just gotten the money and Sandag's just allocated the resources for us to start the environmental process. We anticipate that that could take at least five years, if not more, and so that would be just to get the environmental clearances. After that, the actual project design and actually building the project, since we're staying within existing right-of-ways where you don't have to go buy other right-of-ways, you're looking at you know, one to two years to design it and probably two or three years to build it. And so, so there's another five years, so you know that some of those improvements could be as far as 10 years away. But a lot of what will drive that uh, beyond the 10, besides the 10 years, will be funding. You know, is there enough money to go build that? In, in the case of I-15, going, going back to I-15, the I-15 solution is going to cost about $500 million. The I-5 solution is going to cost probably about seven or $800 million. Construction is already underway at the merge to widen it to 21 lanes by 2005 to coincide with the opening of State Route 56. But to Carol and Chase, more roads mean more congestion. You know, this is this whole issue of, of why building more capacity doesn't really solve traffic because what's going to happen is everybody's going to, you know, move into the empty area and then it's all going to, you know, congeal again. With urban transportation, uh, what people think is the problems is really just the symptoms. The real problem underlying that is the underpricing of our road system. It's just um, too cheap to be able to use roads and, and there's no disincentives. So you have a lot more people using them that, than there is the capacity for them. Those are difficult things to grapple with uh, and so to avoid having to deal with those kinds of problems we tend to look at uh, solutions to the symptoms such as widening highways, um, and that sort of thing, which provide temporary relief, but only temporary. There's one study that showed within five years, uh, something like 60 to 90 percent of the capacity that had been added to highways is generally filled up by trips that wouldn't have been made beforehand. In the South Bay, the Regional Transportation Plan calls for the completion of State Route 125 from the U.S.-Mexican border to Poway, and part of it will be a toll road, a first for this region. Mike Schneider is the head of the company that will build the road, California Transportation Ventures. It's a rather new phenomenon in the United States. Uh, in other parts of the world, it's quite common, frankly, where franchises or concessions are given to private enterprise to build all sorts of public works, roads, uh, energy facilities, uh, water treatment plants, and so forth. But in the U.S., uh, particularly in the late 80s and early 90s with the recession uh, and, and the lack of funding for infrastructure, uh, some innovative ideas came across from the federal government and the, some of the state governments, including California, to involve private capital to be used for developing public works. The toll road portion will run about 10 miles from just north of the border to State Route 54 near Spring Valley. We chose this project principally because we saw the need with uh, the coming of NAFTA uh, with the already adopted growth uh, plans for Otay Mesa and for Otay Ranch. And that makes sense to Kent Trimble. 125 is probably the most critical um, new roadway construction project for the South Bay. As you look at how we're going to grow in the future, there's three areas that are going to grow for residential housing. North County, Central County, if you will, Carmel Valley, um, and then down in Otay Ranch. Otay Ranch is somewhere around 10,000 acres, somewhere around 25,000 homes. In order for those people to get from their jobs, they absolutely positively have to have 125 to get you up and down. Without 125, how do you get from Otay Ranch over to 805, 15, or, or the 5? You go in city streets through the center of Chula Vista. You have to have that north-south link to get you up to the center of the city, get around the congestion, and get you to your workplace. But Allison Rolfe of Preserve South Bay disagrees with that projection. 
Well, the EPA has analyzed that, the Environmental Protection Agency. They say that congestion will remain the same and actually increase on both the 5 and the 805, irrespective of the tollway. From our point of view, what we see happening here in the next 50 years is thousands of new residents, tens of thousands of new commuters, and a lot of people who will avoid paying the exorbitant tolls and instead will be pouring onto existing surfing surface streets and existing freeways trying to get to work and it's going to make the traffic problems on those roads even worse than they are now. We haven't uh, officially set the toll rate yet but uh, somewhere generally in the range of 15 to 20 cents a mile uh, which is typical for new urban toll roads. And we also saw the fact that this road, unlike many others, did not have a great number of significant environmental impacts. It was a relatively benign project environmentally, did not have a great effect on the built environment, nor uh, a substantial effect on, on the natural environment. Well, in general, I, I think it's important to say that we're not opposed to growth, and we're certainly not opposed to growth in the South Bay, but we are opposed to the toll road, and we're opposed to it for one primary reason, and that is it's a, it's a perfect example of bad growth. We will be cutting through some of the prime habitat left in South San Diego County, including the habitat of many endangered species, and we would be facilitating residential sprawl-style development um, in a, in a resource-intensive way throughout the entire Otay Mesa area. So from an environmental point of view, we call it the habitat-seeking tollway. It's pretty devastating. So Rolf's group and others are taking their concerns to court. So we're here today because this coalition of groups, Sierra Club, Audubon, Preserve Wild Santee, and the others are filing a notice of intent to sue the federal agencies for failure to do their job. And in this case, their job is to prevent the extinction of endangered species. And we, believe, we know from expert opinions, um, from all of the biological evidence, that seven Potentially seven endangered species will be jeopardized by this proposed tollway. And one of those endangered species is the Kino checker spot butterfly. The Kino checker spot butterfly used to be one of the most common butterflies in um, all of Southern California. And now it's, it's so severely reduced in range that we're lucky to find any along the coastal regions um, in any given year. And so what, you know, people often ask, well, why does the Kino checker spot butterfly matter? And I think it's really more that the Kino checker spot butterfly is an illustration of the quality of life that we're losing. And do we really want to live in a region without butterflies? Every road project that we're involved with uh, uh, around the developed world uh, is, is now subject to litigation, and, and we understand that because clearly building anything has impacts on people who live there, and that's why we've done our, our utmost over the last 10 years to try to mitigate those impacts. But you can't mitigate all impacts, and uh, unfortunately not everyone escapes uh, an impact from uh, the path of development. It's fine to offer mitigation for a species that is declining slowly or doing okay. But for a species like the Kino checker spot butterfly that is in such, such a sharp decline headed towards extinction, there are just a few individuals left. We need to protect them wherever they occur. And we cannot create habitat somewhere else and hope that they'll do all right in it. It's just too risky. But in spite of some wishful thinking by local residents, the SR-125 toll road does appear to be a done deal. And builders expect to break ground by 2001. While ribbons of concrete may be the most popular option for travel, planners have long encouraged San Diegans to develop alternatives that include safe, reliable, and convenient modes of transit, from walking paths to express buses to light rail. In the classic 1974 document, Temporary Paradise, authors Kevin Lynch and Donald Appleyard called on the region to think more about the pedestrian when planning by avoiding streetscapes like this one, with sidewalks that run along busy boulevards instead of shops and parks, and that communities be planned around attractive transit centers. While some transit centers have been built since then, ridership on public transportation is still low. Only 2% of trips are made on transit, while 98% are in cars. For people to get out of their cars, I think you're going to need a miracle. Um, I think basically Californians are just so used to having their cars, that's what it's going to take. 
I think the only way you're going to do it is if, and I think this is going to happen, traffic gets worse and worse and worse, and people will just have to take public transportation. They won't have no choice. Some people would rather deal with the traffic than to sit up here and have to wait and, and hope that your bus or trolley comes on time. You see what I'm saying? That's the only problem with the, the transit. It's not always a guarantee set time is going to show up. You know what I'm saying? When you got to wait, that's no fun. You want to just get in your car and go. You know what I'm saying? You got to go somewhere, you know? I think it's possible to get people out of their cars and use public transportation, whether or not we can get 100% buy-in is questionable. I think part of society's um, expectation is that you have a nice car and that you are able to go wherever you want to go. I think um, a lot of people who drive would rather, it's just much more convenient. They don't want to stand around next to a bus stop or they don't want to wait, you know, just in case they, you know, just um, miss the last bus stop. They don't want to wait another hour for it. It's just convenient and we are in an instant gratification world, so. It's pretty hard. Good luck if you're trying to do that. That job belongs to Bill Lieberman of the MTDB. Transit Works is the name of our strategic plan that we're developing for the next 20 years. Uh, we discovered that we were doing a pretty good job concentrating on the trees, but we weren't taking enough of a look at the forest. And what we had to do was ask ourselves, where is it that we want to go in this region? Uh, with both transportation and urban development, and what's the best way of getting there. We are embarking on a strategic plan to help us with that, and our plan is based, unlike most others, on a market segmentation study. Because the other thing we realize is we don't really understand who our customers are, nor who our potential customers are. Alan Hoffman was hired to review the results of the MTDB survey, and he found that San Diegans split on two dimensions, flexibility and sensitivity to their travel experience. Now, once we split people up along those dimensions, what we found was that we had six groups. The first of these groups was very high in their need for flexibility and speed and very sensitive about their personal travel experience. And we call this group the road runners. These are people who are running around all the time and quite frankly their automobile is really important to them as a statement of who they are and how it makes them feel. Then we had two groups that were almost identical that just like the road runners, they're running around a lot, a strong need for flexibility and speed, but they're slightly less sensitive about their travel experience. Um, you know, it's important for them to feel good about it, but it's not their whole life. Uh, one of these groups, the way these two groups differ though, because they're identical in those other two things, but the difference is one group was very sensitive about issues of personal safety. They don't feel comfortable visiting lots of parts of the region. They're uncomfortable walking in the gas lamp quarter at night. In fact, they're even uncomfortable walking in downtown during the day. This group we call the cautious runabouts. And the other group, which was similar in every respect except they didn't worry about personal safety issues. That's not saying that they were reckless, but it wasn't a big concern for them. And we call this group the intrepid trekkers. Now the intrepid trekkers is the highest income of these groups. And probably a lot of our entrepreneurs and business uh, professional people, a lot of them turn out to be intrepid trekkers, as well as a lot of apparently elected officials. Then you had a fourth group, still a need for flexibility and speed, but they don't care how they get there. It's not important to them. And we call this group the flexible flyers. They're very flexible, but they still need to fly. Then on the other side, we had two groups with a very low need for flexibility and speed. One of these groups was pretty sensitive about their personal travel experience. We call this group the conventional cruisers. I placed my mom in this group. You know, she has her car, it has to be a nice car. She's not going to be changing modes very easily, uh, doesn't have a strong need to get around a whole lot, but, you know, she's a conventional cruiser. Then you had a, a sixth group. This group really is not especially sensitive about their personal travel experience. They're the lowest income group, so they can't afford to be too sensitive. And they don't have a great need for flexibility and speed in their life. And we call this group the easygoers. 
how do we come up with a transit strategy from it? Well, we go through systematically, and the question is, on every one of these dimensions, what are the things that we can do to essentially reduce the impact, the negative weight of each of these? In other words, if we are able to improve vehicle attractiveness, that maybe can you know, buy us a little bit more attractiveness there, you know, more riders there. Can we reduce trip times? Are there ways we can speed up services? Are there ways we can improve where we locate stations? Are there things we can do to, to improve uh, frequencies? Are there things that we can do system-wide to improve the reach and speed of the system to appeal more to people who need flexibility and speed in their lives? And are there things we can do systematically to improve the look and feel of transit so that people who are sensitive about their travel experience feel better and choose transit more? In developing the strategic plan, we did want to concentrate on a, um, the usual development plan that shows which lines on the map go to which areas. That, that can come later. What we really wanted to get the board to focus on was what role it wanted to take in the region, how intensively it wanted to be involved in the development of the region's transportation and land use. So we are presenting them with four different alternative roles or scenarios. And they vary according to the intensity of four factors. Uh, capital funding for building and buying things, operating funding for operating what you've built, um, land use and trans transit coordination, and finally the priority that's given to transit vehicles in traffic. And by varying the degrees of these, we end up with four scenarios. The first one and the basic one is pretty much what we're doing today um, without much change in that. The fourth and highest is very intensive involvement in uh, land development in the region, working very closely with all of the jurisdictions and how they develop their land and how it's related to transportation. Uh, working with them also to ensure that buses and light rail vehicles have uh, priority at uh, signalized intersections and that there are ways of getting them to avoid congested sections of roads. The second and third scenarios reflect the two versions of Sandag's Regional Transportation Plan. The fourth, and the one designed to appeal to the largest number of potential riders, goes well beyond the RTP. It would manifest itself in expansion of, of everything we have. There would be uh, increased service on existing lines, both, both bus and trolley, but there'd also be trolley line expansions. We've had a plan for a long time showing trolleys going to different areas, but a lot of those lines are unfunded. This would put some funding behind them. So, example, so examples would be uh, expansion of the trolley through Otai Ranch in the South Bay, expansions north uh, up the coast towards University City, uh, a bus rapid transit system on the I-15 corridor, those kinds of things. But then for the buses themselves on local routes, we need more local routes and we need more service on the ones that we have. Uh, many of our bus routes are only operating at 30 minute frequency. For a community this size, we ought to be having at least a base level of 15 minutes with more frequent service in the peak hours. We're not going to be able to do that at current levels of funding. But no dollar figure yet for this fourth scenario. We didn't want to start off being constrained by existing funding sources. We felt uh, it's like any major expenditure you'd make, um, a house, a car. You kind of go out and see what it is you want and then figure out how you're going to pay for it. If you find that you've, uh, you've set your sights too high, then you go drop down to the next tier. But first lay out what it is you would desire to have and then go from there. What we need to do is essentially the first step is do what I call the subway map of a city, which is if you could just say that the connections existed, what would you want those connections to look like? And that's what Curitiba did. Curitiba is a city in the, uh, it's the capital of the state of Paraná in southern Brazil. It's just about the same size as San Diego. The metro area is about 2.4 million. We're about 2.75 million. Now, what's interesting about Curitiba was they asked themselves the question, or before they asked the question, they wanted to have a subway system like many cities did. All they could afford to do was maybe build one light rail line and then begin to start adding on to that which is pretty much the situation of where San Diego was in the 1970s. We decided we'd start off building one light rail line to prove that the concept would work and expand from that. 
But they thought about it in Curitiba, and they decided if they took this incremental approach, the city would continue to grow and develop, but, what it, would, but it would grow and develop around the automobile, not around its transit network. So they said, we are going to go ahead and design the subway system we want today, or we want in the future. And we are going to duplicate it on the surface using buses, but we will have our dream transit system, at least the set of connections in place. And that's what this map over here represents. And they conceived of five major spines with a few key transfer points with a lot of routes that then would make circles around there plus a lot of feeders going out of the edges. Now, the thing though that they did was they realized buses trying to do a subway route, well, everyone knows that buses get caught up in traffic. I mean, what, how is this different from a regular bus network? Now, and you think about a subway, it's either underground, I mean, obviously if it's a subway, or it goes above the surface on an elevated structure, and it doesn't have to ever deal with cross traffic. It doesn't get stuck in traffic. It goes from station to station nonstop. So they said, we're going to make our buses do that. We're going to build stations, just like a subway. That is, there'll be not bus stops on the side of the road, but real stations. And we will create, within our major boulevards, roads within roads. They took two lanes out of the middle and created a bus-only road. And they gave it all the red lights, all the traffic lights, signal preemption of the buses, a little transponder that when the vehicle approaches, the traffic light turns green for the bus, or if it was going to turn red, it stays green. So now their vehicles go from station to station, nonstop out of traffic. The stations look more like those for a subway than a bus, where the riders pay ahead of time, and when the bus arrives, lots of doors open for quick and easy access. Now what they have is a system that operates at the same speed entirely of a subway. And because they did that, they were able to insist on the land use side. They said, we now have our ideal transit system. From now on, all high density, all intensive land uses must be located along our subway, our surface subway lines. And that's why in this image over here, you see generally low density residential areas, family neighborhoods, and along the transit spine is where all of the density gets located in high-rise. As Hoffman sees it, there are lessons to learn from the Curitiba plan. San Diego is actually made up of what I call villages. They're larger units than neighborhoods, or they may be composed of several neighborhoods. And our villages tend to be about one to two square miles in size. All of downtown is under two square miles about. Uh, Sorrento Mesa is about one and a half square miles, roughly. Um, Certainly, Mission Hills is probably at most a square mile, one and a half square miles. And you take a look at these different villages of San Diego. You ask San Diegans what they like about the city. I mean, of course, they'll always talk about the weather and the mountains, the beaches, the desert. But many times, they'll say they like the village-like quality of San Diego, the fact that the different areas of the city are separated by the canyons and, and the green belts and the, the mesas overlooking the, the valleys. A, transit system that reinforces the village nature of San Diego is one that reinforces about San Diego what people love most. And I think that that is something that we need to be thinking about for the region. Now, what would that look like? The idea that if your villages were somehow linked up, of course, not every village with every other village, but a transit system that was based not on moving people linearly along corridors, but rather leapfrogging village to village as necessary. Uh, again, taking cues from the speedy network in Curitiba is one that may make a lot of intuitive sense to San Diegans. You want to go from La Jolla to Pacific Beach? Well, there's La Jolla to Pacific Beach. Then the problem of, well, how do you get around within the neighborhood? There are a number of different strategies for doing that. But now what you have is essentially transit doing two things. Transit first focusing on the village serving the village. How does each village want to be tied together with itself? And what do you do there? And there are all kinds of opportunities for things that you can do. 
And then how do you link up the villages with each other and with the major demand centers, the major employment sites, the major shopping areas, the major entertainment? What you come out of it with is a system that works the way San Diegans understand their city. A bus system has some advantage over the trolley and coaster. I'm a big fan in light rail where light rail is the appropriate solution. Light rail gives you a number of things. First of all, it gives you capacity, particularly when you need a lot of capacity at peak times. Other rail systems give even more capacity, but given you know, the scale of the region, uh, light rail serving the stadium is probably you know, an example where you can get up to 12,000 people an hour through there. I think that's pretty good. I think the problem happens when we try to put light rail in places where the technology is not the most effective at giving us the solution we want. Some of the reasons why light rail can be problematic are because, number one, it is fairly expensive to build compared to certain other kinds of things. It's cheaper than subways, but it's more expensive than, for example, uh, a Curitiba-like busway-based system. Uh, light rail cannot handle a steep hill. It's limited to about 6% grade. And it is more expensive to operate. Lieberman stops short in endorsing any particular plan, but he does want to improve regional transit. I'm very interested in, in being aggressive on this and making sure that uh, uh, this region has the very best transit system it can have. But we are governed by a board of directors, and that board has to feel comfortable with it. Uh, because they're really the people that are making the decisions. So it's very important for us to, to bring them along with us because a strategic plan really is driven from the top. It really is something that the highest levels of management and operations have to be in complete agreement with. The Metropolitan Transit Development Board is made up of elected officials, much like the Board of Sandag, that again has repeatedly funded more roads and highways than transit. What the right mix is, I don't know, but I think we have to do a lot better for public transportation if we really want to make it a major force in this community. We're hearing mixed things about that. There are some uh, segments of the community that feel that things are just fine the way they are, that it, public transportation is a waste, not enough people are using it, uh, let's just give them what they want, which is their cars. I don't think that's a very sustainable future. There are others who are urging us, and the mayor's office is one, uh, they're challenging us to get the same high levels of transit usage that we're finding now in Europe and in Asia. Uh, that if we are going to be a 21st century city, we have to be doing the same kinds of things that others are, have discovered already they need to do to keep up in the world economy. So that's going to take an investment. Uh, spending new money is never popular with people, but if they see what the real advantages are, I think, uh, I think there is a possibility of that happening. The challenge from the mayor's office came from Susan Golding herself, who's using her final months in office to urge the region to move forward on transit. Her chief of staff, Karen Scarborough, explains why. Her concerns were heightened when she came back from a trip to Asia and saw some cities over there engaged in implementing a transit system fully up and operational from planning to installation in five years. The complete system. And she thought, if they could do it, we can. And instead of thinking about a line here, a line here, a segment added here, a segment added there, we need to look at the whole, get a grasp of the whole, and go for the whole. And if that means more money, then that means more money. The money would come from extending Transnet, the sales tax that funds transportation projects. The idea being considered is to link transit with conserving open space and protecting the watersheds. The mayor, Sandag, and others are pushing to get this proposal on the November ballot. The current half-cent sales tax is due to expire in 2008, but all of those funds are, are already talked for, or spoken for. Um, the projects are on the boards. They're being strategized and planned and actually implemented as we speak. So this would be new money. And the importance of doing it now, more, uh, the, rather than nine years from now, is that you could probably get more for your money if you planned earlier and start construction earlier than waiting. And all of the projects that I've found in the public service uh, that we've recently engaged in, delay costs money. And so the sooner that we get to the task of improving our transportation system, we're creating one that actually is truly integrated into our lives and provides us an alternative um, 
the better. While some will object to this tax, the concept of investing in transit has wide support, even from those who build the roads. Well, mass transit is an essential public service, but it does practically nothing as far as relieving highway congestion is concerned. I think you'll find cities with wonderful mass transit systems, such as London and Paris and New York, all have wonderful congestion, unbelievable congestion. So mass transit is not the answer to relieving highway congestion, but it is an essential public service. We, we probably can't build fast enough to, to, to keep up with that rate of growth, and so you know, we're going to need some domain management where people carpool, where people are, use, are, are willing and, and can use the transit system because it's efficient and it's, it's, it's reliable, it's there, it's, it's affordable, um, and, and those kinds of things. That there's no, uh, if, if four million people all want to drive to work at the same time, uh, it's going to get worse than it is today. If we don't do something for planning for mass transit in the future, I think you'll see increased traffic congestion, uh, less emphasis of the protection of our natural resources, and access to them will become harder and more difficult. And when you actually do get to them, I think potentially the quality of them will be diminished, diminished um, i.e. polluted bays and beaches and um, parks that may not be maintained to the adequate um, degree. and ultimately the sense of um, less appreciation of our civic pride. And that's the forecast as we look ahead 20 years. More people, more cars, and with good planning, more choices than spending hours each day in traffic. I'm Shannon Bradley. Thank you and good night. Funding for Path to Paradise is provided in part by Parsons Brinkerhoff. Parsons Brinkerhoff. Planning, engineering, and consulting services on transportation projects in California and worldwide for over 100 years. Proud to be participating in the innovative State Route 125 project in San Diego. UCSD-TV has joined with Citizens Coordinate for Century 3, the region's oldest nonpartisan civic organization, to produce Path to Paradise as a way to start a conversation about the future of our region. If you would like more information about C3, please call 619-232-7196.